for giving us your time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for your first uh, for interview for GMT India. We're very excited because this is our first issue is just out and we've got a long way to go. And we wanted to also congratulate you uh, for winning the GPHG uh, award. I know MBNF is much more than awards and, you know, <laughs> uh, what have you. But but still, I'm sure it's 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 always good to get that recognition uh, from your peers, you know, from your colleagues and as an independent brand, uh, you know, out there. Uh, you know, when at a time when you have all these big uh, groups, uh, you know, big uh, companies uh, out there to, to hold your own, to have your own identity and to be recognized for it. I'm sure that's an amazing feeling. It uh, is for sure. <laughs> um, we, as you said, we don't we never create anything for prizes. Yeah. Prizes don't actually change anything. We've had a certain amount of prizes. They don't change anything to our life. But they do bring one thing is pride. Yeah. <laughs> and as the, the whole point of MBNF is to be proud. Yeah. We don't need them, but I, I can see the team is glowing when, we, when I go up onto the, <laughs> on the, on the stage. And, uh, and it was a very emotional moment for me because I just had dinner with Stephen McDonald a few days before. And uh, he shared with me how difficult it was for him to create. And I know that we've been creating together for 10 years and that... Uh, he was not sure he had enough energy left in him to create a third caliber. Okay. And he just told me there, and there we get Legri d'Or. Mm -hmm. And I was able to uh, actually thank him openly in front of everybody of what an incredible achievement he's done with that caliber. Yeah. No, sure. I, I think I think that, I mean, it's, it's, it's everything. It's his efforts, your vision. Uh, and I think we, we see it, um, you know, get, uh, see, see the brand um you know outperforming itself in with every uh, you know model that that uh, you guys uh, roll out so i wanted to know um mbnf has such a rebellious and a distinctively uh, futuristic spirit you know an identity uh, that it's, it's built for itself so how do you kind of keep innovating and pushing the boundaries is there a certain pressure to kind of you know <laughs> You have to outdo yourself so so you know, it's true that it's not about competing with others but you know 10 15 years ago i i um I was just terrified that nothing would sell, looking at whatever I was designing and creating, going, who's ever going to follow me on that? Now what scares me is to disappoint our, our tribe and, and, and fans. Um, but up till now, it's, I don't think, happened or it hasn't been brought back to me. I think the, the main reason is the worst thing which would be that I would be disappointed with myself. So... As I'm an adrenaline junkie, as a creator, I always want to get out of my comfort zone and create something which is a little bit dangerous for me and something I've never done before. And from there, if I'm amazed by what we're doing, <laughs> I think most people would be. And so it's worked up till now. It really has. Yeah. Oh, that's, that, that's great. So which I wanted to ask you, how do you conceive a timepiece? I mean, I'm trying to get inside. I mean, it's, it's, it's not so easy. We can't do justice to it in 15 minutes of interview. But how do you, how do you um, conceive a timepiece? You know, like, do you start with the design or do you think about the technology or the complication that you want to kind of go ahead with? And is there a trade-off between the two? Because, you know, hmm. sometimes it's tough to get, to get both. So how, how does it work? So, <laughs> First, I've got a very schizophrenic way of working, meaning horological machines are very much coming from my guts. They're a bit like my psychotherapy. I revisit my life and, and something three-dimensional comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Legacy machines are much more intellectual. They come from the brain. It's a tribute to the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th. So one is guts, the other one is brain. So already that is two very different ways. But if we come to especially horological machines, mm -hmm where it's the guts process. Um, initially, I was sketching a lot. I mean, 18 years ago, we can show you sketches of me going from a flat watch to an HM4 Thunderbolt over two years of sketches until I was happy with it. Okay. Um, now, it just comes. So um, you will see uh, in November, HM11 coming out. Okay. And that was an image I saw practically six years ago, okay. which... Of, of, of a house, I was like, wow, okay. why don't we do something like that, which is like that house? Uh, and boom, well, boom, six <laughs> years later, you got a long boom. Uh, so so, so um, I think I've, I've basically, my brain has trained itself because originally, you know, when you're, when you're a watch creator, you're not supposed to create just for yourself, which is what I do. You're supposed to think about your clients. 
And the whole point of MBNF is not to think about the clients in the creative process, because otherwise we'd never create a watch which looks like a spaceship or a bulldog or a jellyfish or you name it. So I don't listen to, to what around people would think. But then you need to, you're in doubt yourself. Because as you're not confronting your ideas to other people, that's, that's a no-no, I don't want to know what other people think, then you're, you're in doubt, like, is, is this... And there was a lot of doubt 15 years ago, there's much less now. I'm not saying I'm better, it's just I've learned who I am, and I, I take decisions. Okay. And that's it. So now, trade-off with uh, the technical part. So the whole idea is designed, we do 3D prints, I put it on my wrist, I'm like super happy, and now we go into the engineering. Now it's that long trek of yeah. that idea, can we actually make it come to life? Can it be exactly how I designed it? And of course there are trade-offs, let's be clear. There are things which are not possible. Sometimes the whole engineering team comes up with great ideas, we're like, why don't we do that? Well, that's even better, and we, we, we improve on it. It's never, if I show you the end, what I thought being the end design and the end product, there will always be differences. But I'll never let a product get out if I'm not proud of it. And so, um, what's, yeah. the, what's the longest time it's taken you to, you know, get a product out, you know? Like, and actually, <laughs> uh, we were talking about that this morning. The, the longest time was actually the bulldog. Okay. Not because it was the most complex. Probably it was only about two and a half years of engineering. Okay. And again, it was two and a half years because it was using of all the knowledge which we had accumulated for the first 14 years at that time. Um, is that I procrastinated a lot. So it was supposed to come out in 2016. It ended up coming out in 2020. Okay. Just because I didn't feel comfortable with the few details. And then I just, I was scared. I mean, a watch which looks like a dog. Seriously, have I just pushed it a little bit too far? <laughs> and, and so I kept on, oh, no, no, let's do something else before, guys. And then finally, March 2020, in the middle of the lockdown, we said, no. go. And we did it. And we got all these messages that week. It was the 26th of March. I'll always remember we were all in lockdown around the world. So three years to, pretty much three years, give or take. Exactly, to, to today. exactly. And, yeah. uh, and all these messages of people saying, it's the only thing which made me smile this week or this month. And I was like, wow, ah, that's cool. Isn't that cool? That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, but that, that's, I mean, I know we're going back three years, but that must have been quite something to, you know, take on that challenge and, and announce, I mean, a, a watch at that point of time. I mean, do you, do you think that was something, you just felt that the time was right, you know, sat on I mean, this for long. We had a lot of discussions internally <laughs> through <laughs> Zoom, of course, because we couldn't meet each other. Yeah. And it was like, we'd already actually delivered the first pieces to our retail partners ah, okay. and everything was ready. And our retail partners were like, well, I can't <laughs> deliver it to any client. I can't show it to any client because you haven't launched it. So you have to launch it. I'm like, but the world has just stopped. Uh, every, for this insane idea that all of us are blocked at home. And at some point we said, you know what? Let's do it. Well, just, of course, we just sent emails out and said, yeah. hi, guys, this is the new. Of course, the media had absolutely nothing else to talk about. We hadn't thought about that. That, of course, no brand, any sane men mental person would actually launch a, a product <laughs> 10 days after global lockdown. So when we launched, <laughs> we were the only voice in the middle of an enormous silence. Yeah, and so <laughs> we hadn't thought of that. And that, so, so we had this incredible resounding system. But uh, yeah, we, we didn't think of that at the moment. No, I'm sure that was not planned. It was much but... smarter afterwards, I find. Uh, but, but I think so sometimes things have a way of happening at a certain time. So I, I guess the time was right. <laughs> and I believe in karma. I'm an enormous karma believer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I think I think you're doing something very right uh, now and in your previous. I mean, if you believe, <laughs> I mean, in, uh, in India we, we believe in, in the concept of previous of uh, births as well. So you know they say that exactly karma. That's how it uh, you know catches up with you. So. I think I think you are on the right track. So, uh, so it takes me to to the another question was um, are the collaborations that MBNF has done. You know, uh, you've collaborated with in, independent designers, with brands. You know, be it um, MBNF in Bulgaria or with Emmanuel Tarpin, the mm -hmm. LM flying uh, flying T. Uh, so, how do these collaborations? How how do they how do they happen? How do you kind of uh, you know how does it uh, come about? It's all about meeting human beings and it's something connects. So um, f if I go back, Alain Silberstein, which the, we were the first to do a collab with him in 2009, 
I was a fanboy for, for, for decades. And I met him in 2008 at a dinner in Singapore. And I was like, oh, Mr. Silberstein. <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the dinner, I said, would you, would you like to redesign one of my pieces? And he looked at me very strangely like, what? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I only had HM1 and HM2. But if you want, you can <laughs> design something. And he's like, yeah, OK. <laughs> and he sent me a, a drawing two weeks later, which was absolutely not what I was expecting. And I was expecting something super colorful because it's Alain and it was a black box. I was like, oh, damn, it's not at all what I wanted. And I procrastinated from, from answering him. And on the third day, he sent me an email like, did you get my first email? And I'm like, oh, now what I'm going to tell to my, to my hero, Alain Silberstein. And I called him up and I said, well, it's not at all what I expected. But if that's what you want to do, let's do it. And that was the very first collab. Um, Stepan Sarpaneva, I'm going to say 2000 and... 10, uh, Basel Fair, we're still in a very small booth in those days, made out of like cardboard boxes. And I come Which out of a meeting, about 2010. 10. And, um, so and Stepan is on a chair in front of the booth and I go and say hello to him, I've known him for many years, and he looks at me and he says, you need a moon. <laughs> like, yeah, we probably do. <laughs> you have an idea? And a couple of weeks later, he sent me the, what was going to become the moon machine. So these are all people that I, uh, I admire. They've got a very strong identity. Bulgari. Yes. Uh, Bulgari is me meeting Fabrizio Buonamassa four years ago. And I had no idea he's an enormous fan of our HM5 because he's an ex-car designer. Yes. And so he was like, ah, oh, I love what you do. And he started sketching an HM5 Bulgari. Like, oh, it would be cool. And we're like <laughs> going completely crazy. Oh, it would be cool to do an HM5 Bulgari. And... Um, and we just kept it at that because, of course, that's never going to happen. And then uh, two years later, um, I bump into him at the GPHG with the new head of the watch division, Antoine Pain. Yeah. I really bump into him at the parking. And uh, oh, he said, oh, uh, he introduces himself. And at some point, um, hey, do you want to do a collab? Because with Fabrizio, we have a few ideas. And the gentleman <laughs> has no idea who I am. goes, yeah, well, why not? <laughs> And three weeks later, we're having coffee in Dubai and he's seeing these two kids, Fabrizio and I, <laughs> sketching on the table. And he's looking at us and like, OK, OK, let's do something. And that's how it happened. So organic so, in a parking lot or a coffee. You exactly. Never know where. So it's not, I don't, I don't go and cold call a brand and say, do you want to do something with me? Just it's, it's meeting organic. people. I remember the first Boucheron piece, the Boucheron piece we did in 2010. I would met Jean-Christophe Bedos, who was then the CEO of Boucheron. And I love this guy, he was really cool, was from the south of France, really nice guy. And, and he showed me around their workshops, and I saw this incredible three-dimensional high jewelry. And in the middle of the thing, I said, look, on the visit, like, you do three-dimensional jewelry, I do three-dimensional watches, we should do something together. He's like, yeah, let's do it. So it's never something which is based on, this is going to bring us money, it doesn't, that's not the point. Um, it's never, a collab only works if both parties have the same values. If both parties want to create a great product, yes. and if both parties are very different. Because there's no point in, in creating something with somebody who's like you, yeah. because then you might as well do it yourself. Yeah, so, so those are for the collabs we've done. And, um, and it's interesting because uh, now we're in an era where there are a lot of marketing collabs coming up, right, left and center, where some brand puts a logo on some other brand mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's like, ugh. yeah. It, <laughs> uh, no, yeah. no, it should be a real creative process where you create a product that neither would have done on their own. It's not just own. changing a color yeah. or, or putting a logo. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the magic that you only you uh, and the other brand would have created together. Together, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, definitely.